The Old Spice Boys podcast has a dis- distinct Mancunian flavour this week, even if our two guests hail from Aberdeen and Newcastle. Martin Buchan played 12 seasons at Old Trafford under four United managers, Frank O'Farrell, Tommy Doherty, Dave Sexton and Ron Atkinson, making 456 appearances for the Reds, many as captain. He won 34 caps for Scotland, appearing in both the 1974 and 78 World Cups. Dennis Stewart had two spells at Manchester City, playing 224 times in the light blue, and was later appointed as a club director in the time before it was swallowed up by the mega billions of Abu Dhabi. His overhead kick, which won City the 1976 League Cup against his hometown club, remains one of the most fabled in club folklore. In the history of this local rivalry, United have won 77 times, City 55, and there has been a regular fusion of colour, controversy, and unfortunate collisions. George Best and Glyn Pardo, Roy Keane and Alf Inger Haaland spring readily to mind. Fast forward to November 2021, and the current Premier League table has leaders Chelsea five points clear of third place City, with United a further three points away in fifth. City, who lost at home in the league to Crystal Palace at the weekend, play in the Champions League group stages tonight against Bruges. United were twice rescued last night by Cristiano Ronaldo, in Atalanta for a 2-2 draw. United's manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, is facing a daily discourse as to whether he's up to the job. Welcome, Martin, Dennis, and my co-host, John Richardson, to our weekly conversation. It's great to see you you both. And gentlemen, you look really, really well. Fantastic. I suppose we should start with your personal reminiscences. And I've just learned before this we went live that you both played in one of the most famous... Manchester derbies of, of all time, both on the, the pitch that day. Martin, would you um, perhaps kick us off and, and re- remind us of that particular match? Well, that was the match that um, confirmed our uh, relegation. Although the actual result on the day, um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't crucial. Other, other results elsewhere uh, were more important. But I'll never forget the look in Dennis Law's face uh, when he backheeled that ball into the net at the scoreboard end. I think he just wished the ground would open up and swallow him. Yeah, it really was, Dennis. I mean, you, you, you had sort of counter counter um, emotions to, to Martin. What do you remember of that day? Um, not, not much in the build-up, um, obviously, because I'd only just been uh, transferred across to Manchester City in the March, end of March. Uh, I'd only been there maybe a month, five, five weeks. So I missed out all the build-up. But obviously, all the local local players in the city team were really, really buzzing about the game. And you know, I think we had quite a few local players in in, in the team that day. Um, so it really was a, a hectic build-up. But I, I didn't quite relate to it at, at that moment because I'd only been there, as I say, four or five weeks. But certainly, the uh, the game was a fairly open game. It was fairly. Uh, probably United had the better chances, and probably if you if you remember, Martin, um, you should have scored way before Dennis scored. I can't remember too much about the game, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, but, neither, uh, neither can I, but it's great on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> What's <Sorry>. YouTube? <laughs> uh, of of course, the uh, game never got the game never finished, did it? It was abandoned because of, no, uh, correct. Yeah, the other fans came on once the the goal, and they realised. I guess they realised that that game meant, as Martin said earlier, meant relegation. But uh, in, in reality, because of results elsewhere, it wasn't that particularly crucial. But um, they obviously thought, uh, and they came on the pitch, and the referee took us off, and then brought us back on again, and then they came on again. And the referee just because by this time all the other games elsewhere in the league program uh, had finished, so United were down no matter what the score was on that particular day. Uh, but obviously the fans weren't aware of that, so uh, the referee just completely finished the game and uh, left it left the uh, extra minutes not bothered. And what was the Dennis like in the in the dressing room after Dennis, uh, knowing what he, he might have done? He wasn't there when when we came. When we finally came off, he, 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 I guess he got himself ready and, and, and just left. Um, all right. But he wasn't, he, I didn't notice him in the dressing room at all. But we were all, I mean, all the, all the local Manchester City um, players come from the local area. They were all cock a hoop, obviously, beating United. Yeah. Um, regardless of 
relegation or any time when the two teams meet, both teams want to win the game. Mm. But Martin, even at any stage, I mean, relegation for a club like Manchester United is is, is a well, not not a nice thing at any stage. But that that particular that particular stage and the circumstances and the emotions. What was that? What was that particular afternoon like uh, afterwards? To tell you the truth, we had too many people in the dressing room that thought we were too good to go down. But I I never felt that. You know, I uh, I, I thought we would need to produce something really special to stay up. Um, however, it gave Tommy Dock a chance to rebuild the team in the second division. And I think we were a better club for it. Yeah, without question. Um, I always remember at the end of the game, because we, we originally, all the, the players met at Main Road, left the cars at Main Road, jumped on the, on the, on the coach, and the coach took you across to, the, to Old Trafford for the game. And obviously, the same on the, in the reverse journey before. What the local players insisted on doing was instead of coming direct to Main Road, was actually going along the Chester Road towards the city and turn around and come along the long way around back to Main Road. Because as we went along the road and all the Manchester United fans were walking away disgruntled after the game, realised they'd be relegated. And um, as the bus was slowly moving past them, that the bus driver was told to beat the horn uh, to the support <laughs> walking past and all the, the city. The city player did give them the two fingers <laughs> and give them the, th the thumbs down. So to me, it was, it was completely amazed because I they were so uh, up for the fact that United had been relegated. I was just happy that we won the game. I mean, Ma Martin, when you look at that side, you know, Alex Stepney, yourself, Jim Holton, Jim McCallion, Willie Morgan, Sammy McElroy, Lou McCary. I mean, to think that that side got relegated, it, it, it seems incredible. Yeah, but the thing is, we never scored enough goals. It's goals that keep you in the division. Not, not a good defence. It's, it's, you know, it's the, the goals for that count. And, and we just never scored enough goals and enough games to, to win enough points to stay out. It's not rocket right. science. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, still, club of that, Mac you still have quite Sorry, a few Dave. chances. If you, you know, when the, again, look me turn back to YouTube, if you see the, the highlight programme on there, I mean, you, you really had far more chances than we did in that particular game. I think it was one, I remember one shot, I think it was from Sammy or Steve Koppel that was throwing Barrett headed off the line. Um, you know, so you really had, on the, on the highlights, about half a dozen great clear chances. And I can't remember many chances where uh, Alex was forced into action, apart from even, I can remember, one shot from himself down to his low left, turned around for the corner. But apart from that, don't recall much, much else uh, keeping them busy. I'll have to have a look at this YouTube, Dennis. So. <laughs> there's, nine, there's, there's nine minutes, but don't take my word for it. Get on YouTube. <laughs> and I, actually, I, I played better than I thought I did on YouTube. In a nine-minute clip, in a nine-minute clip, you tend to probably they pick out the best bits, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't get much of the ball on that day. It was a fairly hectic game. But the atmosphere, you know, that was welcome to Manchester, really. For, for me, it was uh, it was why I, I, I uh, uh, put in the transfer request at Sunderland because I wanted to be a part of the, the the first division, the big games, the big atmospheres, and there's nothing bigger than the Manchester Derby, Old Trafford, or Main Road at that time. You know, so that's what I wanted to be a part. of. Yeah, absolutely understandable. Um, but as you say, Martin, it gave it gave Tommy Doc it gave Tommy Doc the chance to, to to work a bit of magic. What was the um, what was the priority? Do you think um, obviously to get back up, but in terms of team building, what was the what was the things that were needed at that stage? Do you think? Well, he signed a goal scorer and Stuart Pearson um, made all the difference. Um, Stevie Coppel and Gordon Hill in the second division yeah. uh, ran riot. Um, you know, go down the wing. And we we were always taught, if, if you can't pick a man out, if you're on the wing, at the edge of the box, if you can't pick a man out in the box, just fire it in hard and low. And something will happen. Very often, a defender would score a known goal trying to clear a, um, you know, a low-driven driven ball. That was... Uh, Tommy Cavs used to drill it. Tell us every 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 day in training. You know, it was two two wingers though, huh? Two two wingers. That was you know 
one wonderful to see refreshing from a from every point of view but they were they were exciting players weren't they steve and gordon yeah. well the thing was we played a sort of four two four going forward and four four two uh, when we, we didn't have the ball because steven sometimes gordon would drop back to help out but you know it was, <laughs> it was a good uh, it was a good system that suited us and in midfield we didn't have any hard men but they were all, uh, you know, Sammy, Lou, um, Jerry Daly. Daly, yeah. They were all, they're all quite uh, quick, um, and uh, they would toe poke the ball away from the opposition. They didn't have to come through and and crunch them to get the ball back. And we were very, very good at getting the ball back. Yeah, right. But before they started talking about pressing and everything, Tommy Carve used to say. You're a Manchester United player. If someone takes takes the ball off you, you say to yourself, "How dare they?" You know, these scouts. Ask, How dare they? And you go back and win it back. And that was that's what we did. He was a wonderful right. man to have in your uh, corner, Cav. Yeah. You know, Doc, Doc got all the publicity, obviously, but Cav was uh, uh, he got us very fit. He was a good uh, trainer as well. We there was no team in first division. Or the second division fitter than we were, uh, and I know I know that City used to do. Uh, um, they used to have uh, Joe Lancaster and used to tra uh, do the running at uh, uh, Withershaw. Oh, well, right. we went to Withershaw Park. We tried that. Um, it was very effective for City, but uh, we were, you know, we did a lot more short and sharp stuff. Yeah. Again, just referring to Mark Bennett at Manchester City. You were going on to Sorry, win the, the League Cup. Now, just one second, I'm just referring back to the Tommy Kavanagh. There was one, there's one, an earlier derby game that I played when I first signed for Manchester City because I signed on the Monday on the, and, and um, Ron Sanders was the manager. Uh, and we finally done the deal on the Monday and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to play you on Wednesday. And I said, well, who, are we, who are we playing? He said, Manchester United at Met Road. So I thought, bloody hell. So, so I've gone to the game. First of all, when I tried to get in the front door at Main Road, the, the concierge didn't know me, wouldn't let me in because I didn't have a ticket. <laughs> so I, went to, I went to the wrong door. So that was the start of my uh, uh, my introduction to uh, Manchester City. Then during the game, you know, we had Jim Holt was centre half, Mike Summer was centre forward, and they were kicking each other all over the place, um, as you would expect them to. Do. Uh, and then I, I received the ball just in front of the, the dugout early on. And I heard someone shout from behind me, break his effing leg. And then, <laughs> and I turned around, it was Tommy Doherty and Tommy Kavanagh sat in the dugout telling, telling someone to break my leg. <laughs> so that was, again, that was another introduction. That was my, I'd only been there two days. <laughs> it, it was like, uh, there we are, that's, uh, that was my first introduction. And then, then obviously the next, the next one was at Old Trafford. Within the space of about six weeks, eight weeks, I've had a real um, introduction to the to the beauties of Manchester derby games. They obviously, they obviously, I know we're leap, taking the great giant leap of time, but there's still obviously something about it. I know United. Maybe do you think they see Liverpool as slightly the more how, how do we say the team they want to beat and. City not so much, or that was the case. Well, I, it, it, I'd be fascinated to hear your insight into that, whether you think that the, the derby itself is as big as perhaps it once was. Well, I think it is now. I said a few years ago, I don't think so, because we, were, we weren't even on the same plane to compete against them, against United. You know, we, we were in such a, a poor state. You know, when I come up, took over the, the direct in 98, you know, we, were in the, we went down to the third division. You know, so the, the gap between the two clubs, it was just not worth mentioning. You know, there's no banter in the city. There was no competition. It was Liverpool who were Man United big and in that period from probably late 70s to sort of late 80s. Um, it was all Manchester United and Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you find football goes in cycles and, uh, you know, Liverpool had their dominance and winning the European Cups and United under Fergie, they... It, nothing lasts forever. I'm, I'm I'm pleased to see City doing so well because I would much rather, if Manchester United didn't win a trophy, 
be it the the league or the league cup or the Europe cup i'd rather see the other team in manchester win it than uh, arsenal or spurs or liverpool without question yeah i mean there was an article in the, the manchester Evening news uh, about four four years ago uh analysis of the value economically to the city of the two clubs being uh, successful in the same city and the value economically to the city was over 300 million pounds wow. you know that's jobs wow. bar jobs, restaurant travel and i was doing a uh, charity lunch about just before the lockdown at uh, hotel football on friday before um the game was on the saturday and coming down in the the hotel lift there was a big fella you know he, he had a man i souvenir bag, and i got chatting to him he was he's from chicago and he'd come over for the game for the weekend he'd come over for the weekend to watch the game you know so the appeal um was global at that stage and you can imagine what it was uh what it was like between the two clubs because city were on the up united were still holding in there the value of the two the, the two successful clubs in the same city has been magnificent and yeah. I, i've always said to people i'm not anti-united i'm just pro city yeah, I love, I love to see uh, United second behind us. <laughs> you like being the noisy neighbours, Dennis? Love it. Love the noisy neighbours. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, Alex, that, that's a fantastic uh, statement when Alex made it. Yeah. You, could, you could have envisaged in a million years that what would have happened after he said that. He also, he also once famously described City as a small club with a small mentality. He had a way with it, Fergie, didn't he? He's yeah, but way with words. Do it were Neil for many many years we were you know that's that was the, the sadness we, we were we had potential but we couldn't realize it you know we had the poor management and running of the club for many many years you know probably from the mid 80s to, 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 to 2000 it was perfect it was just sad and it was sad to see the way the club was and, and there was no derby game because we were in a different division to United what do you think I mean it's easy to say that, uh, you know an infusion of cash but what was the change dennis what what do you think has lifted city from out of those horrendous doldrums to uh to, 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 well, to the status that, that they are now well, I to... we, we got we got the, the club organized um when david Burnson became chairman john ward was on board supported by david macon myself uh, i brought chris Bird on because what we had to do we had to build up a relationship, a communication relationship with our, with our supporters because <clears throat> we promised so much over the years and, and very little being delivered. So we had to do that. So I, I put together a scheme which Chris Bird, our PR and communication officer, he ran, whereby um, I think we had about 84 supporters branches in the UK at that time. He, they could request someone from the club go to their monthly branch meetings to come out. So we, we went out to the supporters. We went out, we had directors going out, players going out, we had commercial people going out, we had every facet, every department of the club going out and <clears throat> talking to the supporters and getting them, wanting them to join us on, on, on the journey that we hope was going to be successful. Uh, and that's, once we got that foundation, and then we had Jim Cassell in the academy, we had, we had two levels, the off-the-field activities and on-the-field activities were going hand-in-hand hand on an approved basis. Right, and, and and Martin, in terms in terms of United over the last few years, I mean, clearly, as you say, the the, the arrival of Alex Ferguson transformed the uh, transformed the fortunes of the club, although not 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 at the outset. Um, you know, there, and there are those who now say that you know United need to divorce themselves from that. It's there's still there's, there's still the element of it all that has to come back, and the, all, the conversation has to be about Fergie. What 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 do, you, what, what do you make of that? That perhaps his 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 presence is so now o overpowering that it's, it's not allowing the uh, the club to, to fulfil its to fulfil its talents. Well, in a way, it was the same with Sir Matt Busby, um, when he'd been so successful in, in winning the European Cup in '68. That overshadowed. Um, the United managers, Frank O'Farrell, uh, to a certain extent, Tommy Dock. It was always in the background, but he'd achieved, he'd achieved the most wonderful thing, and it was the same like Fergie. You just got to embrace the the success and not let it uh, not let it 
it get into your head too much. You know, the thing is, you're playing for Manchester City or Manchester United. It's a, it's a great honour. Um, I don't think people realise, you know, just... Uh, personally speaking, I would never change. I played 72 to 83. I would never change a second of that time. I wouldn't like to be playing now uh, with the social media and... Uh, you know, although the, the stadiums are, are so much better, and you actually get a decent piece of piece of grass to play football. I was going to say, on all those lovely, all those lovely flat but green, I, I, lush I, pitches, Martin. I treasure every minute of uh, my time at Old Trafford, and I used to love seeing seeing Sir Mark come in uh, to the dressing room and wish the lads all the best for the game. I never, I never felt it was uh, it was a problem. You know, the fact that He'd been so successful. We were trying to, we were trying to emulate his feats, and also even. I used to love going to to Anfield, uh, in European nights. I remember the beat Roma, seven one, seven two one evening. I think Cafu was playing right back for Roma, and people say, "Oh, you are you a Liverpool supporter?" I says, "No, but for a certain period of time." Liverpool was the team that we wanted to be. Liverpool yeah. could go to Coventry City on a wet Wednesday night and win 1-0. We couldn't do that. We could maybe get a draw, but they used to grind out results. And that's yeah. why they were so successful. Yeah. Well, when I get asked the question about who's the best player to play with and against, um, my stock answer, the team, uh, and, uh, there's, there's not one person uh, I hate to playing against, but there was one team, and that was that Liverpool team of the mid to late 70s, because they were so well organised, and as Martin said, so disciplined, just to grind out, work hard, work, keep the shape, keep the system, and the work ethic was unbelievable. And and, and that was a, a benefit to the to, to their results that they got during that period. They didn't, they didn't change the system very often. They might change one or two of the players, but they just... The players they bought came in and fitted in the system. They also enjoyed themselves off the field as well, didn't they? Maybe I have heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. But, uh, nothing, no evidence that I can bring forward. <laughs> well, a happy, you know, a happy dressing room. That's 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 vital, isn't it? And um, you know, you, 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 you know, te teamwork and team spirit will get you get you a hell of a long way, won't it? Basic principles of, of any organisation. It's, it's called team spirit, discipline, and organization. You know, if you can get that, I call it stability, unity, and team spirit. Stability of the, of the, of the, of the, the full organization, unity amongst the various departments, and individual team spirit. And that, 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 those three elements in, in, any, in any walk of business, whether it be business off the field, any business that you get, Stability in the organisation, unity amongst the departments, and team spirit amongst the individuals. And if you've got a good product on the back of that, you'll fly. And you, Dennis, yeah. I was uh, uh, sorry, John, over to you, mate. You seem to have that at Manchester City now, Dennis, with Pep Guardiola and yeah. uh, the two Spanish lads, you know, off, off the field in in charge of finances, etc. I mean, Pep has been absolutely magnificent. Has a fantastic appointment. Um, the big, he's, he's, he's got a big, he's got a big challenge now, John. Yeah. He's got a big challenge because, um, and I'll, and I'll refer to what, what Martin was saying about Sir Alex and the, and the period he had. If you compare Sir Alex's period alongside um, Arsenal Wenger, and I've always looked at that, Alex, what Alex did, he evolved the team. You know, he evolved the team, he involved the coaching setup. Uh, you know, Steve McLaren, Carlos Kieras. You know, he involved different individuals yeah. from the coaching side with Mike Phelan came in. Arsenal Wenger didn't. He kept playing nearly all the time, and, and I think Arsenal didn't evolve his team as well as Alex did. In the first five or ten years of Arsenal's reign, that was fabulous. But when players needed to be replacing and, and coaches needed to be replacing, Arsenal, Arsenal didn't evolve me, didn't evolve at the pace that the Premier League demanded. Interesting. So, so just on the Pep Guardiola thing, Dennis, do you think that you know he's sort of given up his notice, hasn't he, that he's going to go the end of next season. Do you think Manchester City might have the same problem that Manchester United have had about 
finding the right replacement for Alex Ferguson. It's going to be a huge what is changing, changing a success, a such a successful operation as, as Alex and Pep and, and Austin, they're, they're always going to have a problem. Always going to be a big challenge, and it, the, the main the main uh, weight of um, the decision making is on the executives. Do you, do they understand what they need to go along with the evolution of not only the game but their own club as well? Because that, that evolutionary process has to be matched both on and off the field. Nobody's just matching one and not the other. You've got to do it on and off the field, and you've got to stay in pace. With the evolutionary play, uh, pace of the of the environment of the football environment. It's interesting, Martin, bringing that on to, on to United, and you talked about obviously having some Matt there, and now and now Alex is there. This is a testing time for for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, isn't it? As I said at the intro, that there seems to be a daily debate about whether he's up he's up to the job or not, which is a hell of a um, a hard life to lead, even though you're being you know remunerated pretty well. Uh, to, to, to have your to have your ability as questioned as intensely as his is all the time. Do, do, do you feel for him a little bit in those circumstances? Well, I'm sure that Ollie would have, would have been aware of that when he took the job. But to go back, if I go back to Pep, you know what I like about Pep? If you don't do the business, you don't play. If you if you're not well, when you, your when game, when you've got choice, you're not in the team. Plus players, it helps. <laughs> but uh, that that's that, that's the biggest my biggest feeling about Man City. Yeah, you know, you think, well, why is he not playing? Why is he not playing this week? And you think, oh, I remember that. Yeah. He's, he's he's done something that that wouldn't be happy with, and that's it. It's the hardest thing, you, hardest thing for a player to be left out, to be left out of the team. But also, when you have support, when you have supporters looking at the team selection on a Saturday, and they're going, "Oh, why is he picked him? Why is he picked that?" And then Martin and Lord, what what the, the supporters don't appreciate is the manager and the coaches will be analysing the players Monday to Friday before they pick it on the Saturday. So if, if there's somebody not not on his game in the training, or he's, he's not quite picking up the instructions, or he's not quite fitting into the system they're looking at, or he's not quite understanding what the opposition who who are going to play on the Saturday, if he's not picking all those information up, then he might not be playing on the Saturday. But the, the supporters don't see that and they don't appreciate that. Um, they just think, why is he not playing? As Martin says, some Monday to Friday could have a somebody who's having a real bad time on the training pitch, and therefore. The manager can't trust him for the game on the Saturday. There was a there was a, a piece, a very interesting piece, actually, in the Irish Times this week. Uh, I know, not perhaps the font of all knowledge about United, but it, they did a piece specifically on um, on Ole, and and said United have as their boss someone who is not in demand for any other job in professional football. How can that be right? In other words, if 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 United were to to get rid of Solskjaer tomorrow. Nobody else would, would go for him. If City decided that Pep Guardiola was, was no longer uh, you know, their manager, you'd have every club in the world trying to sign him. Uh, do, do, do you concur with that, that Solskjaer is probably in a job that uh, it's the only job he could possibly do in the game or would do in the game? Ah, it's a I tough think, one, isn't it? I think United saw him as a safe pair of hands when... Uh, when they had gone for the superstar managers and they they didn't they cut it and uh, he knew the club inside out he'd been a wonderful servant and uh, if he had one or two breaks here and there he could, he could have had a, a trophy to show for it yeah yeah because he so, hasn't actually he hasn't actually won anything yet has he and it's you know three three years at united uh, i mean that that would normally be a, a Turmoil, you know, the clubs, the clubs in crisis. Yet he's he's he still seems to be the man. Does it not? But did, did Fergie not take three years to turn around? He did. He did. To be absolutely fair, no. As I say, it's uh, it, as Martin said, it is what it is. It's a it's a heck of a demanding, it's a heck of a demanding job that that you guys. You see, you guys know what goes on in the what went on in the dressing room. We, we think we used to think we know, but of course we didn't really. It was uh, it was it was sort of ninety percent guesswork and ten percent we hope someone told us. Um, yeah, well, 
there's, there's that many of you guys now, though. <laughs> now we've had a different opinion to each other. So it's it's a real. I think the, the general arena now, the football arena now, is so competitive, both on and off the field, in the media, supporters, in the club itself, commercially, sponsor, all that. It's such an it's such a um, the environment is so competitive right across every fact, facet of the club, and that's difficult to manage. Yeah, and you need a you know the, the United, haven't they, Martin? They 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 went they went for Fergie's chosen replacement, David Moyes. That didn't quite work out. Then it's then it's Van Hal. That didn't quite work out. Then it's Mourinho. Um, they, they've kind of they've leapt around, haven't they? Since since the great man's um, retirement. Yeah, but people forget that it was nearly three years before Fergie uh, turned it round. And in fact, Matt Robbins saved his job. Yeah, Coventry, Coventry away. Yeah, Nottingham Forest. Nottingham Forest, Nottingham Forest in the League Cup, wasn't it? I think. It could have been. It, yeah. it, it could have been. Uh, I think there were certain people on the board were beginning to wonder if he was the man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Mark Robbins uh, scored that goal, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah. I mean, he's a you know he, he from Aberdeen. Um, well, not from Aberdeen, but he came from Aberdeen to to United. Mark, did 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 you, did you know Fergie? well when he became the United manager? I made my debut for Aberdeen in 1966 against Dunfermline Athletic. Um, I was actually marking their, their playmaker. Uh, every, every Scottish club had a, an inside forward who, who was between five foot six and five foot seven and a half. And everything went through, through him. And it was my job to man mark Alex Edwards but playing centre forward for Dunfermline was a certain Alex Ferguson. Right. So, so I, I knew him from day one in my, my professional career. <laughs> wow, that's, and, that's great. And, and I've, I've got to say, he made a big impression on me as well. <laughs> oh, for, those of you, for those of you in audio only, Martin then just sort of raised his elbow and dug it in. <laughs> so you, 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 you had a brush with him on the very first day you played. Well, he was a competitor. He was... I remember when when United were weren't doing so well, uh, when Fergie was, uh, you know, well established there. I I, I had the cheek to to go uh, to say, you know what you need, Alex, you need to sign an Alex Ferguson because they didn't have a for a while that they, they were playing wonderful intricate football, but they didn't have they didn't have a a centre forward quite like Fergie because if you weren't chasing Fergie, he was chasing you. You know, if we had the ball, he never let you settle in the ball. He never give you a minute's peace. He was an absolute nightmare to play against, and so you can see how that carried on into his uh, so is that career. Got, is that why he got for, went for Joe Jordan? Um, I don't. I think you'll find. Uh, Dave Sexton inside Joe Jordan. Was it Dave? Was it Dave? Was it? Ah, oh, see. Yeah. Before Fergie. But yeah, um, just... no, he's he's always been a competitor to Fergie, you know, and you know, he once said to me that he'd had to change. I said, I don't know how you manage these days with all these agents. You know, the, the agents is, speak more in the paper than the players do these days. He says, I had to change. He says, I, you know, throughout my career, I've had to, I see things that I don't like, but I've had to change my, yeah. my attitude, uh, you know, to keep on top of the job. Well, that's the point I made earlier about the evolution of the game. Alex stayed in pace with it, both on and off the, the ways agents and people, various uh, different people coming into the game, agents, players, media, and, that's, and Alex evolved with that. And, I, and, and I've read both of Pep's book, Pep Revolution, Pep Revolution. And Pep evolved from Barca to Bayern and Bayern to City. And he stayed pace with that. Now, the big challenge for, for Pep, because other clubs now are looking at the way we play and saying, this is how we play against Manchester City and setting a different st a style up. Now, you were lost against Crystal Palace last week. You know, they're all sitting deep, sitting deep. So our penetration is not as... as uh, as, as as well as it w was a couple of years ago, you know. So that's a challenge for Pep. Can can he evolve in the next couple of years 
um, well, well, the season and a half he's got left now, um, to really um, change the, the way the team, team players or bring one or two players to to change the system that he wants to play. You know, so he has challenges at the moment, very much so. It's a fascinating moment, isn't it, for the, for this match? I mean, obviously, we don't know how City are going to do against Bruges tonight. We assume they're, they're too good not to qualify from their particular group in the in the Champions League. But there's a, there's a, there's a lot riding on this match on Saturday, isn't there? Cool, I would think so. It might, over and above, it's a Manchester derby. You know, you could put that standalone game, it would be something standing on it. But the fact that, you know, we, we've got this uh, Champions League game Tonight, United did well last night in the end. Um, as you say, Oli, Oli's been under a bit of pressure. Pep, you know, we've, we've got a few points behind and um, I would suggest the owners are looking to to at least get somewhere near the Champions League final again. Um, so there is a little build-up of, of, of pressure at the moment. And how, what about your from, your from your side, from the United side, Martin, this, this weekend? I mean, Ole, as I say, he's a... Every day there's a story saying, "Can he last this week? Can he last the following week? Can he last the week after that?" And now he's got now he's got City after you know after a a good win at Spurs last last weekend. But mind you, the way Tottenham played, it was a, a good a good time to play them. What what do you make of this weekend's um, match up? Well, I just don't know what United team is going to turn up. Sounds nervous to me, Neil. Martin Buckingham's nervous. Mm. I've never heard that. Never, never known that before. Not, it's true, isn't it? Well, it's... well, if I was in the squad, I'd have some. I might have something to say about it, and might be able to influence it. But uh... I think he, I think he's got a couple of systems that he seems to be comfortable with now, Martin, doesn't he? You know, with Pogba and then Ronaldo and Cavani. Either Ronaldo and Cavani up front, Pogba in the midfield behind Bruno Fernandes. So he's got a couple of. Systems that he's played in the last couple of games. Um, yeah, well, well, Pogba won't be uh, won't be available. Um, although he played there yesterday. Night. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been very impressed. I've been very impressed with um, Cavani. I yeah. Think he's, yeah. I think he's a very very good pro. Um, Ronaldo. Uh, you know, whether you love him or hate him. He's done the business since he arrived. He's carried that team with, with the goals he scored. Well, he's got 10, 10, 10 goals in 11 games, I think. Some, uh, it's just a fantastic return. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if we can just move back a, a, a little bit, it was, it was, I was very disappointed when Ibrahimovic got injured because he was having a very positive effect on the younger players uh, at United in much the same way that uh, Cantona did yeah, with, with yeah. the class of 92 um, and I mean Lingard was buzzing when Ibrahim was, was there um, don't see so much of him now you know he, he was he, he was a, he was a key man for United at one time and then he, he fell out of favour and I, I think he came under uh, the wrong influences when other yeah. players joined the club yeah, or other players' agents. Well, <laughs> but um, he definitely found his spark at West Ham last season, didn't he? Yeah, yeah well, well, he's always he's always had that ability. Yeah, but I, I think he started. Uh, he lost his way. He wasn't concentrating on his football like he should have been. And I say, uh, you know, and I, I think there's a certain individual. Uh, who, who joined the club uh, had a lot to do with that. A player, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, my, my neighbour across the road is Paul Pogba, so I keep my eye on him. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you for That's that. Interesting. interesting. It, 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 but he's, about, he's about 30 yards away from my house. Mm. Oh. So I'll keep an yeah. eye on him. No, 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 more, no more revelations than that, Dennis. <laughs> I'm very rarely see him. He's very quiet. Pop. I spotted him a couple of times out walking with his wife and the baby. Um, he's once out on his bike, just messing about on the road. Apart from that, you see very little of him. I mean, the two the two most talked about transfers um, of the last two or three months are obviously Ronaldo coming back and Grealish joining City from from Aston Villa for that astronomical 
fee. Um, Ronaldo certainly capturing the headlines every day. It's not so much well the quality of the goals and the timing of them, isn't it? At the moment that um, marks him out as something special. And Grealish is just slowly but surely have, having an impact. Dennis, do you think? Yeah, well, I think he, he was the the head honcho at Aston Villa, um, and everything revolved through him. All, all the forward, all the forward play seemed to go through Jack. Uh, get the ball to Jack, and then see what we can produce in the last third. Um, you know, he's not asked to do that. He, we've got other players who can do. So he's got to be able to be a part of a group, not just the only one in the group. Um, and I think that's, he's just learning a little bit as well about pass and move and pass and move because at Villa, he said, get the ball and sit on it for, I think he had about normally at least five, six, seven touches. And that's why he was one of the most foul players in the Premier League because right. he kept the ball too long. Well, we insist on the pass and move and, uh, and I think he's he's just getting used to that that system. And uh, I mean, he's got the ability, no no question. But he's just got used to the the system and the way of playing that Pep wants to do it. I remember you saying, Martin, when we chatted in the week that uh, you, know, you you were once uh, Manchester United's record signing. I think you had that title for how long? Was it five days? Yeah, for uh, four or five days. We signed the story more, um, and then. I cost 125,000. Ian Storyman cost 180,000. That took cheap. the pressure. That, I'm, cheap, Neil. I'm dead cheap at heart at the price. No, that took the pressure off as me as, you know, United's biggest signing. And then uh, along came Rodney Marsh for 200,000 for City. And the three of us were photographed outside the Bank of England in King Street. Bank of England signings. <laughs> and then. Um, Soon after that, we, we played City in my first derby at Old Trafford. And I played uh, played a 1-2 from my half into the other team's half. I got a return from a guy called George Best. And uh, I smashed a, uh, an unsavable shot <laughs> into, the, into the net at the Stratford end. But, Is that on YouTube? Is that on YouTube? I need to look at but, that. But United... Uh, but United, Yeah, it's a black and white, Dennis. Uh, <laughs> Put United in the lead, but uh, Rodney came on. I, I don't know if he started the game, but he came on and scored. I'm sure he scored, and the beat is 2 1. So my first derby ended in defeat. Yeah. But um, you scored the great, your greatest ever goal. Didn't score uh, many from 35 yards, did you, Martin? Uh, I, I averaged uh, one goal every two and three quarter seasons in my time. <laughs> at, uh, but they're, they're all good ones. I think mine was. I think mine was average over two or three four games. De Dennis, I'm back. I'm back after some technical difficulties to no, talk no. about your 1976 goal. That was the best goal ever seen at Wembley. So it was voted. You know, yeah, the head well, kick against the tune. Yeah, it wasn't bad against the tune, was it? You know, under the circumstances, uh, Newcastle rejected me as a 15 year old, so it wasn't bad. No, that was a, that was a classic. You also you mentioned earlier about Paul Pogba being a neighbour. Um, I mean, can I ask both of you what you think of Paul Pogba at Manchester United? Whether it's a never-ending story, you know, he's always wanting to leave or whatever. It seems to disturb the whole fabric of the, the dressing room. You asked me that one. Yeah, well, go on, Martin, you're, or well, either of you. He's never, he's never produced it for United as he has for for France. Yeah, I at the national level, um, probably only he can answer answer that why he I hasn't mean, done so. Even if you look at the system that you've seen, uh, Oli been changing around, just trying to get the best out of him. But I think once once they brought uh, they brought Bruno Fernandes into the team, for me, that is that is Pogba's position. And once they brought Fernandez in, who's been outstanding, you know, I, I just don't see where the fit Paul Pogba in that team. Because I, I think yeah. he can only play as a number 10, just behind the front one or two. I don't think he's disciplined enough to play deep and, and break play up and start from deep positions. I, I just like to see him in behind two or in behind one. Well, do you think, do you think it's inevitable then he will leave in the summer on, on a free, free transfer? Because it, well, it doesn't think, seem much sign of him signing a new contract, does it? Well, I think Mina needs a bit more money, doesn't he? You know, Rayo, he's not, he's not, he's not any money for a few few months. 
So maybe he's, uh, he's short of a few bob. So maybe it certainly looks that way, the way things are, even in the team selections, you know. I'd, I'd like to see him, because sometimes when he, when he plays, he, is, he, has, he has got ability. And as Martin says, you know, you watch him play for fans, and he's outstanding in that group. You know, he, uh, you just wonder, and he's a, he's a World Cup winner. You know, for goodness sake, you don't get that by being a bad player. Um, so you just wonder what that little that little issue is and uh, whether it changes but at the end of the season. I think, it, it, as Martin says, it's all dependent on where United finish at the end of the season. If they have a, a good run, a bad run, or if he gets so There's still such a long way to go, but the fact that he's, he is available on a free transfer in May, um, you know, that, that is interesting to see with the, uh, what, what happens then. Or a fee in January, I don't know. Hmm. I, th I think you have to to remember that uh, a certain Alex Ferguson let him go. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I, he fell out with his agent, though, wasn't it? Was his agent? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, me and that uh, was the same agent. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it was a fallout yeah. over his contract with that with that agent. Yeah, who who and, he, and, who he and despised. Also, and also the 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 Italian league probably suited his style of play better than. Uh, the the, prem, the Premier League. Yeah, he was only 19 right. he, when he went there, Martin. He was only 19 when he went to Juve. Juve. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, yeah but, but, he, but he's 28 now, and he just seemed to have learned much uh, yeah. about yeah. club football in the time. Yeah, I agree. Like, as you rightly said, he's got a World Cup winners medal. Uh, he's, he's one of the most talented players I've ever seen at Old Trafford. Um. Probably in the top three for sheer ability, but sometimes you need a bit more. You need application to go with that ability. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. desire, application, the, the usual things that we apply to the Premier League. You know, that's what makes it so unique: is that desire, that that uh, determination to be a, a success, the work rate, uh, the the, uh, the commitment, the physical aspect, the mental aspect. There's all these. Things that come to our games makes our Premier League so special. Because Dennis Kevin De Bruyne is an example of that, isn't he? What you've just mentioned, he's he's got everything. He's got work rate as well. You know, the sweat, the perspiration that goes with his skills. But he's been questioned now about you know why why is he not playing uh, at the top of his game game in the game out? But because he's had that he had that awful injury in the Champions final, he's had a bit, bit of a uh, problem with his uh, was it his knee or his ankle? I think he turned his ankle. Um, yeah, and he's, he's been in and out of the team with injuries. Um, so, and the team has been evolving a little bit. So, we haven't had the exact. We and the one thing we haven't had is a number nine you know, because he, he he links up with the number nine like David Silva did with Sergio when they were together um, for many many years. So, you, you look again: is, is is Pep evolving the team quick enough or? Is this situation with the Harry Kane problem in the summer? Because maybe the, we expected Harry Kane to to sign, and it's not. And uh, we didn't have a plan B on, 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 uh, on transfer transfer um, purchases. I I love watching De Bruyne when he's on his game, and you know when he's fit. He's got a, he sees a pass. He sees these passes that nobody else. Uh... That, I'd, I'd love to be on the end of those passes, man. I'd love it. <laughs> Get yeah. someone like him, you know, just because you know, if you make a run, you're going to get the ball. If you make the run, he's, he's sick. And, he, and I always remember when I was a director, we had a, a midfield player called Ali Ganabia, uh, whose vision was yeah. impeccable. And we played Sheffield Wednesday away, and we won, I think we won about 4 2. And Ali scored the first one, Paolo One Shop scored two. And Paolo One Shop made a quote to the press afterwards. He says, Ali Ganabia. Sees us before we see ourselves, <laughs> and that's Brilliant. that's what Kevin De Bruyne. He's got this vision. He's got this beautiful vision, and he can make make the players. He, he pass the ball, forcing the players to go and get it. You know, it's because you can see where they are and plays in the space behind defenders, which you know you, Martin, as a def as a defender, would hate. Like you've done by Tommy Kevab Kavanagh knocking the ball across the face of the goal. That was behind defense defenses, and that was a, a nightmare when you're forcing defenders to turn the face of their own goal. I, I know he, I know he's got a decent job at the moment, but do you, are you surprised that Roberto Mancini doesn't seem to get a mention when big jobs in? 
in the Premier League uh, are coming up. I mean, he he did a he did a fantastic job at, at City. Yet, as I say, he seems to be overlooked. I mean, w- w- wouldn't he do a fantastic job at Newcastle, for instance? I think he's very happy where he is. I think you know oh, he's got. A, I'd say he's got a good job, and maybe he he just wants to see the World Cup through. Yeah. But you yeah, think I, there might be some some probing for for someone of his of his talents. I think he he ward ward all that off. He wants to take Italy to the World Cup at the end yeah. of next at the end of next year. And I'm sure that's what he wants to do. Then then he he'll look at his options there because the game is fast moving. You know, Newcastle job won't be available then. Man United might be. Who knows? Man City might be, but certainly uh, I would suggest he'd want to go to the World Cup. That is that is a pinnacle. That is the best of the best as a, as a manager uh, uh, to take the team into the World Cup. But how could he top uh, Mancini? How could he top what he did at City if he came back to work in England, winning yeah. the league with and, United? And, and as you as you said, Dennis, he, he's happy uh, running a, a national side. Maybe did, maybe. He might want to go and uh, manage in Germany rather than come back to England. You, you yeah. know, you never know. But uh, I remember uh, I went to the first game at uh, the new stadium, the council house, as it was called then, um, before it became the Etihad. He played, he played Barcelona. Yeah, a, a pre-season friendly. Yeah. Um, Ronaldinho was playing for Barcelona. Remember. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's still still fresh in my mind. That yeah, I'm that just was, trying, that, that trying was, to think how long ago that was. It was 2003, August, August 2000, July, July, end of, end July, end of August 2003. Because yeah. the Commonwealth Games were 2002, we had eight, nine months. Mm-hmm. So that was the start of the next season. So it was a, I mean, that we needed that's that's what we. We built, um, when I was a director, I was to be a part of that group that got us into the Premier League, into the new stadium. Joe Rawlin, Kevin Keegan, two, three promotions in four years, and then into the new stadium. And that's, and I took great pride in, in being in that game and watching, because we had 35,000 people because it was a restricted capacity because of testing purposes. And uh, just seeing so many blue and white shirts in the stand and seeing Man City walk out with Barcelona. And I thought, that's where we should be. Mm-hmm. And, and I was happy to, to make that contribution. Well, the PFA the PFA had a box at uh, Main Road and then they took one at uh, the new stadium and I used to love going, uh, yeah. going there on match days. So. Yeah. That's a, a, I was on the stadium design subcommittee so I was, a, I was very much conscious of the uh, the design system that was going into the stadium. And it was all state of the art. It really was. A, it's a state of the art. There's not a there's not a bad seat in the stadium. You can see brilliantly from everywhere. Um, and now they put the extension behind one of the goals, just increased the capacity from 47 to 54, I think it is. Um, you know, so without question. To, and, you know, United's got their 75, 74,000. It's, it's great to be in this city at the moment when the two teams are going head to head. Who do you think stands most to, to gain from, from winning on, on Saturday? Obviously, going to be Man United there at home. They have to win. I mean, you know what social media is like now. I mean, Man United have to win on on, on Saturday. Um, I'm fascinated to see what the team selections are, Neil. I really yes. am. Yeah. Uh, because you can just get it, the understanding of what what's happening now in the in the coaches' room at the Etihad and the coaches' room at the United training ground, and they'll be thinking about this game. Well, we'd be thinking about the game tonight, but Petrol, be, the, the selection he has tonight, I think we'd be thinking about the game for Saturday as well. So it'll be interesting to see what his selection is tonight. The starting 11, of course, not, not who's on the bench. Um, because without question, both managers will be thinking now about Saturday. Pet, Martin, Pet, your... Pet, Pet was saying that he thought the game against Bruges is more important than Manchester Derby. Is that just a bit of kidology? Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. Without question, think, and quite rightly, yeah. you know, you've got. I mean, Alex is a the R. He's the he's the number one man of, of uh, psychology, isn't he? You know, um, it's something that Alex Ferguson would say because it just deflects from the, the game on Saturday because the supporters will be thinking about Saturday. I think Bruges is going to be. It won't be. It won't be an easy game tonight, but uh, 
it won't be as important to the to the supporters as Saturday. And I'm thinking that Uli uh, and his staff will be hoping that uh, Varane is fit for the weekend. Because oh, uh, he didn't he didn't start. He was on an interview this morning. Didn't sound too uh, hopeful, did he? Oli he said we'll have to check him out. Um, yeah, he, he he was off with an injury, and I think he yeah. tweaked his hamstring uh, last night. Well, you, you don't half tweak a hamstring, Martin, as you know. You either tweak it or you don't tweak it. You know, and if you tweak a hamstring, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm unfortunately I'm a hamstringologist, I have hamstrings so often, um, you, you've got to rest it. It's seven to ten days minimum, even if it's even if it's a slight tweak. Well, if it's cramp, well, that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. So these med uh, all these medical men will be looking after them. In fact, you know, the the medical man, the chief of chief physio, head of physio at Man United is a person who I recruited into the academy in Manchester City. Robin Sadler, he's now head of physio at Man United, and we brought him in head of academy uh, physio uh, when I was a director. And we brought him in, and he, 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 he then was promoted uh, to first team, and then Frank Lampard took him to Derby. And then he's now head of physio at Man mm -hmm. Manchester United. So, you've got, and he's a good man. He really is an excellent, excellent physio. So he'll be looking at the, the physical side as well. Um, so we've got we've got contributors both on uh, both both sides of the fence here. Martin Harry Maguire is a guy who um, l l let's say uh, you're either for him or against him. There's there's not many grey areas where he is is concerned. Are you are you confident that he's he's the man to be the you know a long standing centre centre back for United? Um, I think he, he started off very well, but when he first joined the club, uh, but every now and then you see a little lapse. I don't know if it's concentration or I don't think he's 100% fit, actually. Yeah. He doesn't look 100% fit to me. I think his, his build, Martin, if you look at his build, I think he's one of these guys who needs to be playing and needs to be training regularly. And if he has that that lapse or injury or that, that um, period off the, off the training pitch, I think it takes him a lot longer because of his build. Mm -hmm. He's chunky. Um, yeah. he's, he's, quick in, he's quicker than you think. Um, but I think he does need to keep, keep, it, keep his sharpness going. Um, and he needs to do that by playing games and training. Swapping, and on, the, swapping on to the other side, Dennis, what about John Stones? Are you a John Stones fan? I mean, obviously, the two of them link up at England. I was, right, so. I was then I wasn't, and I am now, um, because I think he's come to. He's had a few personal issues to manage, as you as, as you well know. You guys in the press will know, um, and he's he, he went through a bad patch, and and Pep just took him out of the firing line um, and managed him, and he's came back. And I, I don't know why he's not been playing in the last few games because I thought he started off the season very well. Um, in fact, he got him back in the national team, didn't he? Um, so I'm just not uncertain about that. Um, but now with, um, Laporte is uh, banned for Saturday, isn't he? He's, he's, he's out because of the red card on Saturday. Does he miss this game? I think he does, yes. Yeah. So it's, a next, it's the next Premier League game, isn't it? Um, so he's missing. So I would guess it'll be Diaz and Stones, which was the, the formation that stood, stood, stood the test of time last season. Interesting. Uh, to go back uh, for me, you were talking about Jack Grealish. I think I think Pep's doing a wonderful job with him, teaching yeah. him the, the city way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, like you said, uh, he's not the main man anymore. You know, he's got Foden there playing alongside him, who I think's a, a wonderful player, and I, I think Grealish is is more or less accepted that his first year is going to be an apprenticeship and learning from the master yeah then from from pep you know how because he was a one-man band at villa virtually yeah, correct be honest, I, I can't see him starting on saturday uh, i can see him on the bench but i can't see him starting um, why is that dennis well i just think the game will be so quick and so um um intense um, I just don't think he's ready for that at the moment. I think, is, as Martin said, Peps wants to ease him in. This is his first first season. He's only been here a few months. First um, a derby game. 
And I, you probably put him on the bench, and when the game the game gets a bit, you know, the game gets stretched in the last twenty minutes, twenty five minutes, um, you know, bring on bring on Grealish with a bit of space that he can he can use the ball then. But when it's so intense, the first, as you know, Martin, the first hour is like chaos, isn't it, on a derby game? You know, you can't get room to breathe, never mind room to play. Um, so I think I would prefer to see him starting on the bench and let the the, the rate the, the sort of normal the regular players regular uh, selected players to start the game who have more experience with the club and the way the the club plays. I hope it's good. I, I hope it's going to be uh, a very uh, hard and fast first hour. Absolutely. Uh, I, well, it should uh, it should uh, be if, if it's not there's somebody. You know, if if the the Rio United doesn't turn up, um, doesn't bear thinking about. Yeah. You know, they they've really got to, they've really got to come out of the the traps flying. Will you be live? Uh, will you be live at the at the stadium, Martin? No, I will. I won't be there. Nervous. Uh, although nervous. No, um, to tell That's you the truth, Dennis, I don't go to many games now at all. Oh. Wow. Um, I've reached a stage in my life that there's nothing worse than wasting two hours, two hours of your life watching a terrible game of football. As long as I see the highlights, and uh, I've got other priorities in my life. And uh, lovely, as long, yeah. as, as long as I see the the highlights and uh, the goals, I'm, I'm happy. And uh, of course, I read uh, I read uh, all the good writers in the newspapers. Hi, Neil. Um, <laughs> you never said that when I was actually <laughs> when I was in Manchester, oh, Martin. Got to keep you on your toes, haven't you? That's absolutely yeah. right. Oh dear! <laughs> Do you realise? I was just thinking, uh, if you were, if you were writing about me and Alex Stepney, now that your nickname would be Butch. Butch, I'm uh, trying to work that one out. Harmon, the golf. The, Butch, the golf. Oh, Butch Harmon, the, go uh, the, yeah. the golf, the uh, golf pro. Oh, okay, uh, very good. That's, very what, good. The, that's what you be. Well, so I've been called worse. Uh, you're, getting away with, you're getting away with murder then, Neil. Goodness me. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what Fergie used to call me, I know that. Because you used to pro him and ask him silly questions. Well, that was that. I tried. I tried. <laughs> but uh, Well, th this is the thing that I, I, I think is missing these days, and without turning this into a nostalgia fest, I think that the relationship that, that, that journalists had with players in the days yeah. before social media meant that I think that we probably could cover the game with a slightly greater in level of insight than it, than is available now. It all seems to be, I mean, managerial conferences are done very much in this in this Zoom format rather than actually, I know that we've got a pandemic, but it strikes me as very sad that the, 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 the license we had to mix with you guys seems to be missing and therefore people can't write with the, the sense of a bit more of an understanding than, the, than yeah. they could in our days. Yeah, but not only that, Neil, there's, there's more of you as well because of the, the appeal of the Premier League. You know, you've got so many social media, you've got so many podcasters, you've got so many uh, uh, foreign foreign journalists coming in. You know, there must be a, a horde of media people now on match day. So it's actually containing containing the numbers as much as anything else. And I the easiest way to do it is just put a, a manager in, in front on a, at a desk on a dais and just... A couple of questions from the from the assembled throng. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think under the circumstances, that's probably the best idea. To, uh, because, to be perfectly honest, Neil, some of the questions I, I see coming from the media to a, to the manager are, are ridiculous. So I can't believe some of the questions. Um, you know, the the the, the experienced ones will come up with the, the the sensible questions, the realistic questions, and the questions that everybody wants to ask. But then you get you get one or two off. I can't get my head around some of the questions that I might ask. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bound to say I'd, I'd love to see Martin in, in, in combat with some of the with some of those younger ones of today. Well, they just all they want is a bit of sensationalism, isn't it, Manil? That's all they want—a bit of reaction. They'll throw they'll throw a hand grenade into it as a question and hope it blows up. We never did that, Martin, did we? No, well. Oh, there, yeah, were we there were certain journalists. I mean, I, 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 I could, there's certain journalists that I got on very well with and respected. Uh, uh, for example, uh, James Mossop comes to mind. Uh, I thought he he's was. My, uh, he's my neighbour. He's my neighbour as well, Jim. 
God, you Paul Pogba you... one end, Jim Moss at the yeah. other. Hey, blam, he's only half a mile away, Jim. No, he, no. Often, he often walk on his morning walk, he walks past the house. I, I, I was there when uh, he got the Sunday, uh, the Sunday Express. Uh, as he got t- tapped in the head with, with a copy of the Sunday Express by Frank O'Farrell when we were in uh, Berlin on, on a pre season trip. Because Frank didn't uh, agree with uh, his column that week. <laughs> he came on the bus and Frank clapped around the head with a rolled up Sunday Express. Oh, man. Uh, but, uh, we, uh, we, I had a, that silly journalist you're talking about, Dennis, at, at Coventry. It was the first game of the season. It was, uh, it was boiling hot. And the players' lounge at Coventry was right at the top of the stand, and I, you know, you had to, and it was quite a high stand at Coventry. Yeah. And I was gasping for a, a refreshment, <laughs> and and uh, I went to, I went to go into the players. Finally, it must have been about seven hundred stairs you had to climb, and I was going into the, the players' lounge, and this guy I'd never seen in my life before, puts his hand in my chest. He says, uh, have you got time for a quick word? Uh, And I came out with a velocity. (laughs) Then I said, then I said something, I said something else that wasn't quite as polite uh, (laughs) and, and brushed by him to to get my beer. Uh, But but that was uh, later appropriated by uh, Gordon Strachan. Yeah. I used to use that one. Yeah. But, um, no, they're, 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 I think the relationship with press was. I think my relationship with the press. I came to Manchester United from Aberdeen, and I was playing for Scotland. And the Scottish press didn't like Anglos, as they called them. You know, people that had gone to play in England. Uh, because the Scottish press was Glasgow dominated, and if you were playing in the Scotland team. You're keeping a Rangers or Celtic player out of oh. that team, and the, 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 they weren't very keen on uh, uh, the, the lads that had uh, gone south of the border. You know, to, to, to better themselves and play in a better class of football it was uh, a strange setup. But no regrets, as you said, no regrets either of you guys for your time you spent in Manchester. Certainly, well, you're still there no, now. No. So we're both, yeah, we're both still here. We're both enjoy the football we're both appreciative of what's going on here we understand it we enjoy the uh the successes we don't enjoy the failures but we enjoy the successes and you know i'm sure both of us want both of our teams to do well the thing is i was uh, i had a great respect for dennis as a player and also i got on very well with francis lee and mike summerby uh you know and the thing is, the fans stoke up this derby hatred. But you're playing against somebody you, you like and get on with. Yeah. You try harder than you do if you're playing against a complete stranger. Yeah. So, the, you know, when it came to the derbies, Franny Lee was, was doing his utmost and I was doing my, doing my, trying my hardest and Dennis was doing his best for his team, you know, because he was playing against guys that, that he respected and got on with but it's always better when you put one over a friend yeah yeah well, i remember the again just a, a, a manchester derby and then martin remembers it for a different reason but it was when we in the lead up to the 76 cup final we played united in the november i think it was the fifth round at, at main road you know packed out main road and um we, we beat them four nil and i got two goals um and after the game my wife and i were going to um sell a v for dinner, um, which is old, which is run by a big city fan called Max Brown, and uh, we got there at about maybe half past 10, 11 o'clock at night. And when I walked in, the place was bouncing because it was a city um, restaurant, and I got a standing ovation <laughs> when I went in. You know, so that that was that was like I'd only been here eighteen months. I was a real realization the importance to the supporters of the Derby, the Derby games. Um, and I, and I think it's I think it's fascinating. I think it's fabulous when you have that that real competitive edge, where people live in the city, support the, the clubs, 
Uh, and all the, well, now we've got so many people come from outside the city, supporters travelling for the games. It gives the Manchester derby such a global a global attraction. That's why Sky pick it to kick off at 12.30 on a Saturday. Yeah. I used to love playing at Main Road. I yeah. thought it was a great stadium. But not only and... that, do you know why? Because it was one of the biggest pitches in the, in the league, Mark. Yeah. So you have loads of play, loads of uh, space to play in. You know, so it was, uh, it was a lot, lot of the yeah. time, the last 15 it... minutes, our, some of our opposition went out of steam because they didn't realise how big the pitch was. And it had a, it had a very high quality pitch because Stan Gibson was a groundsman. Correct. Stan I was, used to, yeah. I, I used to get on very well with Stan and uh, but when the teams were coming out, he would be standing there at this end of the tunnel in his in his blazer. You know, and he's he's got the pitch already and he's going to get changed and he's and I remember one day I I did the old Tommy Cooper trick on him uh, when he was when he was walking when I was walking past him, uh, I said, hi, Stan. And I, and I put something in his, his top pocket of his blazer. And I think he thought it was a five because I said, have a drink on me, Stan. And he said, oh, thanks very much. And then when he went into his pocket, he found it was a tea bag. <laughs> that, that was the old Tommy Cooper trick, <laughs> that. Have a drink on me. Yeah. No, but he, I used to love Stan. He's a great ground, but he hated when we used to train. Sometimes the manager would have you on just for the Thursday or the Friday, just for a little warm up yeah. on the pitch. He used to do his nuts with the manager, <laughs> tell the manager. Yeah. I don't know. Whether, I don't know whether Rico can you hear us? Yes, I can no. hear you. No, I don't. I don't if, if, if John can hear us. No, we can't. We can't hear him because I was going to say, did he have? Did he, did he have a final question? But we can't we can't hear him sadly. I think no. technology. I think technology technology's doesn't... finally caught up with him. <laughs> no, very, very. Anyway, gentlemen, look, it's been an absolutely brilliant um, hour yeah. and quite hour and quite a bit. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as no. as much as we I have. I was delighted to see you again, Neil. It was really made my day. Oh, now now you are now you're getting carried away, Dennis. <laughs> No, you look fantastic, the pair of you, and it's just it's just so nice to to, to reminisce. But to um, you know, it's 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 a, it's a match that's had so many memories for you guys more more than us. But um, tremendous, tremendous, and let's hope let's hope Saturday's lives up to expectations. Absolutely, look forward to it, and uh, just uh, relax, man. Don't get too uptight. Just watch for the team selection. That's the most important thing for me. Good on well, you guys. I'm hoping it's going to be a draw and everybody will be happy. <laughs> well, a draw probably away from home for Manchester City would be happy. Gentlemen, again, very, very much appreciate your time and your no thoughts and, and your conversation. It's been a treasure and wish you every success. Okay, no problem, Neil. Speak again best, soon. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, Neil. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much to Martin and Dennis for their wonderful insight and memories of matches and matches gone by. This edition of the Old Spice Boys podcast was edited and produced by Sam Sethi. You can find us on Amazon, Spotify, and other major podcast platforms. Look us up at www.oldspiceboysfootball and our Twitter address is at the Old Spice Boys. Come back and join us next week for another sparkling edition. <laughs>